Okay. All right, welcome everyone. We will be starting in about two minutes. Okay, I'm going to put in the chat. Yeah, we've got a chat rolling just so we can, yeah. So we won't be able to see participants. Is that right, Harper? We'll just. Um, are we? I'm no, sorry. you will not see participants and they are all on mute. Just um, the panelists. Okay. Yeah. So panelists. you'll just be the panelists and then the right. Yep. Oh, New Jersey. I used to be from New Jersey. <laughs> Welcome, Bala. Welcome. All right. Well, we're going to get started. It is eleven o'clock Eastern Time uh, on the dot. So welcome everyone to demonstrating the importance of accounting to make better business decisions while emphasizing or de-emphasizing debits and credits. Uh, I'm Harper Christopher, uh, Marketing Manager for McGraw-Hill along with Noelle Bathurst who we are both hosting today and we'll be following the chat um, to share with um, our esteemed author team which we are so excited to have uh, here today. Um, we are joined by three of the authors uh, from this uh, exciting product, Wayne Thomas, Michael Drake, and Jake Thornock. And with that said, I am going to pass it over because I know they've got lots to talk about today. All right. Thanks, Harper. I'm going to kick us off. My name is Wayne Thomas. I'm at the University of Oklahoma. I've been on the faculty here for 23 years, currently serving as the uh, Senior Associate Dean for Faculty and Research. So, I want to thank you for joining us today. We have lots to talk about in our book, Financial Accounting for Managers. Um, and just to let you know the, the genesis of this book, we spent a, years thinking about what products people like to use in their classroom, both from the Spiceland Intermediate book as well as the Spiceland Financial Accounting book. So what we've done is we've taken years and years of good pedagogy for resource creation, and we put it into our new book, Financial Accounting for Managers. So lots to share with you today. I hope you'll feel interactive, include any questions in the chat. Uh, we'd love to respond to any, any thoughts you have today. All right, so just really quickly at a high level, what is this book about? It's developing real world perspectives and getting students ready for their career. So lots of real world feature story, illustrations, analysis. Uh, we're gonna talk about the auto graded cases, really focus on decision-making and analysis, both in the pedagogy as well as the assignment material. And again, we're gonna go over lots of that and really make sure students are getting critical concepts. Cause what we've seen is there is a need for a book in the market that focuses on managers and the decisions that managers are making. So we wanna structure the book and its assignment material to specifically speak to students that aspire to be managers. That's chapter structure, it's key points, in chapter problems and so on. We're also gonna talk about sustainability cases. And then finally, wrapping up all of this pedagogy using technology to enhance learning on the McGraw-Hill 
Connect platform. So we're going to talk just a little bit about videos, but all of the materials that are available with auto grading ease for you. And then, of course, if, you, if you're creating a new product and you want to do a really, really good job at doing what you do is you go out and find really smart people to help you. And so that's where we've added Mike Drake and Jake Thornock to the author team. And these guys are fabulous to work with. We've had a real uh, enjoyable time working together to create this new book. And so what I'm going to do now is I'll come back in a little bit and explain some more of the material. But right now, I want to hand it off to Mike Drake. Jake. Jake's going to go first. How about that, Jake? Exactly. <laughs> plan. Jake will go first. Yeah, I'll follow. Absolutely. Up. All right, let me get the slides going here. Well, welcome, everyone. We're, we're so excited to have you here. Um, excited to uh, meet some new people and really excited to share our, uh, our new book, uh, Financial Accounting for Managers. I'm going to focus on two concepts, uh, flexible teaching and teaching to a broad audience. And so to get started, let me just talk a little bit about my background from a teaching perspective. Uh, I've taught kind of all over the place. Uh, you know, I'm sort of midway through my career and I've already taught PhD students, master's students, EMBA students, certificate program students, accounting undergrads, finance undergrads. I taught in a sports management graduate program and I've even done some uh, financial accounting training for uh, analysts at a large investment bank. So I've had a chance to teach accounting to a lot of people who don't necessarily uh, go into accounting. And uh, that's helped me get a really good perspective on uh, different ways to teach accounting to different types of students. Throughout all of it, our viewpoint, and, and this is a viewpoint that, that all of us have as we are building this book, is the idea that all of our students, whether they're coming from sports management or whether they're coming from finance or accounting, they'll all be managers and decision makers. And we wanted a book that would, would sort of help them in that uh, learning pattern. And wherever they're going, we wanted them to be able to learn financial accounting for whatever path that they end up taking. So with that in mind, uh, I actually want to just poll the audience. If you would put in the chat, how many of you are teaching students who are not necessarily the traditional accounting students? And if you are, just sort of put the course that you're teaching and or the type of student. I'd love to just see in the chat, it's, it's helpful for us to know uh, our audience a little bit, who is teaching who. So if you wanna go ahead and put that in the chat, if you have a few minutes, uh, that'd be great. And I'll keep going while we, while we see that. So given that many of our students are not destined to be accountants, it sort of demands two things from us. First, it demands a, a level of approachability that, that requires us to sort of meet the students at their level, rather than demanding that they meet us at, at our level and that they learn every nitty gritty detail of accounting, we instead meet them at their level. It also demands that we be flexible in how we teach, in what we teach, and in the timing of how we teach things. And so I'm gonna focus on those two things, approachability and flexibility. So first, let me start off with this idea of approachability. Uh, one of the things that I've, I really enjoyed is teaching a broad uh, array of students. So right now, well, not right now, I just finished a, a couple of weeks ago teaching an executive MBA course. We used financial accounting for managers as the primary text for that course, and it was a blast to teach, in part because we have a huge variety of students. We have a pharmacist, we have multiple dentists, we had uh, multiple VPs of marketing, one of VP of finance, we had a CFO, we had a, a, an equity analyst. So we had a huge variety of students. Some of these students were sheer experts at financial accounting. And there were other students who didn't even know that balance and sheet were words that could be put together. They had no idea what accounting was. And so it was, it was really neat to take this book to them and uh, let the book speak to each of them in their own, uh, at their own pace. So one of the things we really worked on as a co-author team was to write the book in a conversational and approachable style. I'll show just a quick example of that, but this, this style, this conversational approachable style flows throughout the entire text. One example that I liked 
you know, when we talk about retained earnings, we can get into the nitty gritty details. But what, what we've written here, and I have to credit my co-author Wayne Thomas for writing this, retained earnings just simply all net income since the company began minus all the dividends since the company began. It's a very simple way to explain uh, an important concept in a, in a conversational and approachable manner. Uh, another way to be approachable is just the way that we've structured the book. Uh, we've structured the book basically to have three segments in each chapter. So the first segment will be the fundamental parts. Uh, the next segment will, will, will be analysis, and then it'll also have some expanded parts. This allows you to pick and choose as an instructor the things that you need and that you want to emphasize. So again, going back to this executive MBA course that I just finished teaching, I focused on the fundamental parts and the analysis. We didn't have time or uh, necessity to get into the expanded parts, so we didn't. But the book is compartmentalized in a way that, that allows you to choose as an instructor the things that you want to focus on. To show an example of that, uh, let's look at uh, chapter six, which is inventory. This is just kind of the, the intro page that shows how, the, how the, the chapter is broken up. You can see that we've got the fundamental parts. These are the main things that I focused on in my executive MBA class. I also focused on analysis. And then for that class, I decided not to cover the expanded parts. But I'll talk about later, I'm going to be using this book in an undergraduate accounting class. For that class, we need the depth and detail. And for that class, we will be delving into all of the expanded parts in, in this chapter. That's the beauty of the book, is that, it, that it, it's approachable enough that you can use it in a way that your students need, depending on the type of student and where they're coming from. Okay. Okay. The second thing that I love about this book, and it's one of the, in my, in my view, one of the str its strengths, one of its best features, is its flexibility. Right? As I've mentioned, we have all of us that just have different teaching styles and different needs, just based on who we are. But we also have a, a huge different, uh, well, a lot of different students, a lot of different needs, a lot of different uh, course lengths, even different programs where we're teaching in. And the idea of this book is to try to be flexible enough to handle those. And let me share the, the five ways that we believe this book has some very unique flexibility. The first is the ability to emphasize debits and credits. And I'll go into this in detail, and I'll, I'll even show you some slides that, that flesh this out. But this is, this is a book that allows you to either emphasize debits and credits, as you might want to do in, in certain classes, or de-emphasize debits and credits, as you might want to do in other types of classes. And instead, what we focus on are what we call financial statement effects. And I'll show you an example of that. We also have built, as I mentioned earlier, the, the book to have a multi-part structure. And we've designed it so that you can uh, let it flex or let it, let it, let it uh, expand or contract different varying course lengths and different programs. OK, so let me focus on this idea of emphasizing or de-emphasizing debits or credits. Um, so I would love, again, just in the chat, when I promise we're gathering all of, all of your information. Uh, do any of you teach a course without debits and credits? If you would, just drop that in the chat. I'd be very interested to see if any of the attendees uh, have that kind of a course. Here's what the book does to try to allow you to use this either-or approach. You can use debits and credits or not. The, in all of the chapter, the book has uh, the balance sheet and income state, statement effects of any basic transaction or uh, any basic um, uh, event that's happening uh, at, the, at the company. So for instance, if there's a sale of goods, you can see how it affects the financial statements. This is what we call financial statement effects. But the book will also have the corresponding debits and credits and the T accounts that go along with that. So you've got all of the above if you want it right in the in the chapter. Mm -hmm. So in my executive MBA course, uh, we just tell the students, you don't need to worry about the blue boxes. All of the debits and credits are in blue. You don't need to worry about the blue boxes because we're not going to be emphasizing debits and credits in that executive MBA course. But we do tell them, focus on that balance sheet, focus on that income statement. You do need to understand how events and transactions affect the balance sheet and income statement. And that flows throughout the whole book. Um, 
It also flows throughout the homework assignments. This is something that we worked really hard on. So let me give you an example of that. If you were to go into Connect, and I've just got this screenshotted, but this is exactly how it looks. If you were to go into Connect and suppose you wanted to start an assignment for chapter five, well, you would go into Connect, select the source, and what you can see is we've got a drop down for all of the different types of uh, homework assignments you could assign. If you were to scroll here on the scroll bar, what you'd see is that we've got different types of exercises and problems. We've got exercise, brief exercises, exercises and problems that do not require any debits and credits. And that we've got a whole different bank of exercises and problems that do ask for journal entries. So you're allowed to, uh, or you, you're, you have the, the option to basically pick and choose the types of problems that you want to assign. So again, for my executive MBA students, I focus on these top three, these exercises and problems that do not require any debits and credits. Um, if you jump in a bit, you can see that uh, you can even toggle debits and credits on or off in the problems that you assign. Uh, you simply just filter on that type and you can say debits and credits, yes, or debits and credits, no. It makes it really, really easy in building assignments and in building uh, tests. And then even in the back of the book, if you have a hard copy of the book, this is just sort of screenshots. We'll have the same problem twice. One where we have the problem without debits and credits and one where we have it with, and they're always linked so that you can, you can show both. I actually, in my undergraduate class, I, I teach a lot of debits and credits and I like to assign both of them. I like to say, you need to understand the financial statement effects of a given transaction, but you also need to understand the debits and credits of a given transaction. So it's nice to be able to assign one or both if you like it, okay? Another point of flexibility is this multi-part structure that I mentioned. Uh, we've got, uh, basically, here's just three examples. In a revenue chapter, we've got three different chunks. We've got the primary analysis, we've got the expanded analysis, or the expanded parts, and then we've got the analysis section. And that holds true for every single chapter, okay? And the last thing I wanna emphasize is that there's, there's even within our co-author group, there's a whole bunch of different needs, right? So Wayne teaches different things than I teach and Mike teaches different things than I teach. So I wanted to show you briefly just even how we use the book. How do I use the book? How does Wayne use the book? How does Mike use the book? And what I love about this is it really illustrates the flexibility that this book offers, right? So Mike and I co-teach an executive MBA course. This is the one that I just mentioned. It's a really intense uh, all day kind of course we teach all day on a Friday, you know, from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. And we do six sessions of that. It's not a full length class. It's what I'll call a term length. Um, we don't use any debits or credits in that class. Mike, right now, he'll talk maybe a little bit about this in his segment. He's teaching a full-time MBA course that goes the entire semester. He also does not use any debits and credits. Wayne, when he has a chance to talk, he's currently teaching an online MBA course that's asynchronous. In that course, they're using debits and credits. And then starting in January, I'll be teaching an undergraduate accounting class to uh, hundreds of students. Most of these students are going to apply to our accounting program. We need a very rigorous uh, accounting treatment of debits and credits. So we will have uh, a lot of debits and credits in that in basically in every single day. And this book can expand to, to meet that need. So again, I hope you see just even within our, the three co-authors, we're sort of using this flexibility at its fullest. And that's one of the things we love so much about this book. So in the end, um, all of us, uh, everyone in the audience, all of the, the, the authors, we're all training students to be future managers and decision makers, regardless of where they're going and regardless of their background. And with that in mind, we need to be approachable and flexible. And we've worked hard to, to write a book that meets those two needs, that's approachable and flexible. We hope that honestly, because of that flexibility and that approachability, it just it's going to make your life easier as an instructor. And uh, that's it. I'll turn the time over to, uh, to Mike now, who's going to talk about some other really neat features of the book. Thank you, Jake. Let me share my screen here. Hello, everybody. It's a, uh, is my screen coming up there? Thumbs up from a co-author. Thank you. Good. 
It's a pleasure to be with everyone. So my name is Mike Drake. Uh, I'm, I'm at Brigham Young University along with Jake. He's two offices down and I've been here 11 years. And like Jake, I have, I'm mid-career and I've taught accounting to just about every group that Jake put up there. I'm currently teaching executive MBAs, full-time MBAs, and I'm developing a course, a, a brand new introductory financial accounting course for undergrads. These are these large sections, you know, 2,000 students a year uh, where we are significantly de-emphasizing debits and credits, which is something I, I put there in the chat. I've also taught intermediate, um, higher level accounting where, where I have taught with debits and credits. Um, and so I'm excited to share another element of this book that we're, we're excited about and uh, that we're looking for some feedback on. And that's the idea of getting the real world into the classroom. So it turns out that when we think about managers, and when we think about managers making decisions, they're gonna do that in the real world. They're not going to do that in the classroom as soon as they leave the halls of our universities. And so a big emphasis of, of the development of this book and a lot of the time that Wayne, Jake, and I spent in, in sort of collaborating and brainstorming was around the idea of getting the real world into these resources and then ultimately into the classroom. So I'd like to start with just a question. And, and respectfully request your, your feedback in the chat. Just put anything in there that you're currently doing to get the real world into your classroom. This could be tools you use, cases you use, uh, vignettes you might use, um, or, or if you haven't been doing that, or if you are doing it, are there any specific challenges that, that you face as you've tried to get the real world real world context into your courses. And I, I'm struggling to see the chat, so I'm gonna rely on my panelists here in my setup if there's any, any questions that arise from there. Um, our students need to understand how the world works because soon they're gonna put graduation robes and enter that world. And so as we've thought about it, we feel like there are two key things that our students need in order to navigate the complexity and the messiness and the nuance of the real world. First, they need exposure. So we need to expose them to that. While it's great to talk in our classes about a made up company, say Stevens Sweet Shop, you know, that has $1,000 in assets. Well, that's fine. That's not what the world's gonna look like when they head into the next, you know, into the next phase of life. Uh, and so exposing them to the, com you know, the complications and the nuance of the real world is important. And then two, just understanding that the world is complex isn't enough. We need to train them and arm them with tools and frameworks you know, in their minds so that they can understand and analyze this financial world. So a lot of the energy that as a co-author team we put into this book was, was spent here. How do we get students exposed to the real world throughout the, the book and throughout our materials? And then how do we arm them with tools to navigate that complexity? I'm gonna briefly now talk about each of these and I'll open up again for some uh, questions as we go along that you can respond to in the chat. Okay, so let's talk about exposure first. Every chapter of this book begins with a feature story that highlights a, a different company, okay? And it, generally we, we go with companies that students would be interested in, companies like Disney and Apple and Lululemon and, and Dropbox, companies that, that, that they would have some exposure to. But then beyond that, throughout the chapter and in, in nearly all of our learning objectives at this point, there's some element of the real world being brought into the text. And we do that in several different ways. Uh, whether it be, if you, if you look here, we've got little excerpts from financial statements. You see an example here from Disney, that's their depreciation note, where, where we talk about what's disclosed. You see here at the bottom, there are figures and tables that use real companies. In this case, we're looking at the, at the mix of, uh, of debt and equity financing to give them an idea of how capital structures different, uh, differ across different industries. And then here at the top, we have these sustainability uh, little vignettes 
that are scattered throughout the book that all leverage real company disclosures to give them exposure uh, to sustainability in that way. I've only picked a few small examples. These are scattered throughout the book. Uh, I've included a screenshot here of the company index. You see, I've only given you what partial letters A through J and already there is represented maybe, I don't know, that's probably 30, 40 different companies. I would say in all over a hundred different companies are featured in some way throughout the text. And again, we do this rotating through the industries, service companies, manufacturing companies, research and development companies, financial institutions. You know, we do this to provide as much exposure to the, to, to the nuance and the complexity in the economics of different uh, companies. So these, these things are scattered throughout the chapters. Now, at the end of chapter materials, we of course all have all of the traditional accounting questions in the end of chapters. These would be you know, brief exercises where they're calculating depreciation, slightly longer exercises where they have maybe two or three parts, and then longer problems that maybe take 15 to 20 minutes to complete. So all of those traditional problems and, and, and uh, exercises are in the back of the book. But we also have a complete set of what we call real world perspective cases. Now, these cases are actually, I actually consider them different tools because through each of these cases, students are being armed and are practicing using either a framework as a tool. How should I think about earnings management? What's a framework for thinking about ethics? Or they're actually using specific tools going into the SEC Edgar database, looking through filings, searching through footnotes, uh, using tools of financial statement analysis to compare different companies, uh, using tools in Excel. Uh, Wayne Thomas will talk more about Excel or using uh, visuals in Tableau or in different dashboards. So we've got a complete set of suites, uh, a, a complete suite of cases where students get exposure and have oppor more opportunities to practice using uh, financial tools, that uh, many of which they'll be using in their next life after graduation. And the great thing about this is all of these cases can be auto-graded. So you shouldn't look at these and say, oh, well, the grading on this is gonna be onerous. You know, Grading earnings management cases, grading ethics cases, I don't want to go into Excel and have to grade formulas. All of the cases are auto graded. They're in Connect. I'll show you how easy it is to assign these here in a, in a few minutes. And they can be assigned and they can pro help provide students with these extra opportunities uh, to, to get in the real world, the messiness of the real world. Okay. So question, I'm just going to pause here. In terms of cases, I'm curious. Uh, we, we'd love to get some data and some feedback. What, if if at all, what types of cases, and I'll add tools there too, so cases and tools, what types of cases and tools are you currently using in your course? Um, and, and, and if you have, you know, a few extra keystrokes there, you, you can tell us whether you use them sort of as pre-class homework type stuff, or if you use it in class, we would love to get some data uh, on, on what types of things you're doing in your classrooms. And again, Noel, if there are any questions, you, you know, I had to just pause. If you have a specific question about anything that Jake has said or that I have said to this point, please just put that question in the chat. Noel or Harper will cut me off and they'll say, hey, we've got a question coming from New Jersey or Saskatchewan, wherever you might be. And uh, we would be happy to address any of your questions as they come up. You just need to let us know there on the, uh, on the chat, okay? No questions so far, Mike. A couple of really great um, uh, suggestions from participants around how they integrate real world in their case. So um, bringing in a discussion board where students uh, answer questions on real world cases or including media review assignments based on real world or real time events. Um, those were a couple that came through. Fantastic. Thank you. Excellent. Um, let me just share some personal experience that I've had trying to get the real world into the classroom and specifically cases, contextualized cases. 
when I first started teaching here at BYU, I, I, I was assigned the full-time MBA program. And I, I taught undergrads prior to that, but I started to do some MBA teaching. And I figured that MBAs, uh, you know, as non-accountants, they really need exposure to, to sort of the real world. They wanted it contextualized. And this was actually my first approach where I just sort of ran down the balance sheet income statement and then did, did the walk down of our balance sheet accounts. And I just tucked two cases in at near the end of the semester. And uh, th these were sort of longer cases that took up, say, 75 minutes. And this did not work very well, in part because after 13 sessions, they were already acclimatized to, to learning the, the specifics of accounting. And then I suddenly shifted gears and, and, and was teaching a case-based approach in the classroom, which was kind of a different frequency or a different style to what they'd been used to. And, you know, it just, it just didn't work. It was a little bit clunky. This is what I do now using this new book. It's very similar in terms of, I have one, one more session here, but it's very similar in terms of the, the topics I cover, I cover. But as you see now, cases in real world companies can be layered in and laced in throughout the entire course. You see these company names and uh, some of what I do with these companies, it might be an earnings management case or it might be an Edgar case where they go into the SEC Edgar website and look through some disclosures. Some of these could be you know, more of a data analytics case where we're looking at data visualizations and answering questions. But what's nice about this is cases in the real world can be layered throughout the entire course. And, and I'll tell you, students absolutely love it. You know, they, they just are not as excited about learning how to record depreciation on company ABC. Instead, if we can actually put up JetBlue's depreciation footnote and then use that information to calculate, well, this is what the depreciation is on an annual basis for their aircraft because they disclose the useful life of their aircraft is 25 years and they disclose how much they've paid for their aircraft. Okay, now we can actually calculate depreciation for the JetBlue aircraft. And again, it just sort of, it's a slight shift going from company ABC to JetBlue, but it's, it's powerful. And what's especially nice as instructors is if we're armed with resources that just do this for you. Uh, again, this book, what, what, what we've injected into this book are Edgar cases and sustainability cases and earnings management and um, ethics. And these resources are there already ready for you to go to deploy in your classrooms. Okay. Now, in terms of these cases, the, the other just sort of touching back on the flexibility Jake talked about, you can use these cases however you want. I currently use them as pre-class homework. So before they even come in and talk about depreciation and pro fixed assets with me, they've done an Edgar case where they've looked in the footnotes and learned about fixed assets through footnotes. They've maybe done an Excel assignment where they used Excel to calculate straight line and double declining depreciation. They've done a dashboard assignment where, where they've had some visual visualizations around depreciation rates that, you know, Wayne will talk more about those. And it creates just a nice rich set of pre-class materials. And they come in armed already with some real world context seated in their brains. And then in class, I always try to do at least one or two different cases. Maybe we'll go to Edgar. Maybe we'll look at a footnote to talk about a earning, you know, an ethics or an earnings management um, uh, dilemma, for example. And we even use these in our exams. You know, I, I know Wayne does in his class. Jake and I do in ours, where we assign some of these real-world cases in Connect in their exams, where they're uh, where they're working through problems set in the real world. And again, the beauty of this is that all of these, well, from an instructor perspective, the beauty is that all of these are auto graded. Okay. So how would you do this? Like th this is, I want to just show you in Connect how simple it is to assign one of these cases. So I've got a screenshot here. This is what the Connect interface looks like. And what I've done is I've clicked on the real world perspectives suite of resources. And 
And you can see this for chapter five. This is a, a accounts receivable and revenue chapter. And what you see here at the top is we have four, we call these Edgar cases, where they go to the SEC Edgar website and look in the footnotes and financial statements of Delta, Apple, Dropbox, and General Mills. If you wanted to assign those cases to your students, simply check the box, you hit assign, and, and there they go. They have the, the questions and the directions, the instructions to go in and answer those questions. You see here, we've got a financial analysis case with American Eagle and Buckle, and then you compare those two in comparable analysis. The ethics cases are here, sustainability, uh, reporting cases, earnings management, and then a continuing general ledger problem. It's as simple as selecting the cases you want for that particular week, assigning them to your students. And again, these things are auto graded and uh, it, it's just a nice, efficient way for instructors to get the real world into the, heart, into the, into the course. Just gonna wrap up with an email from a student. I gotta tell you, I, I've, I've been using these cases for a number of years, different Edgar cases, different Excel cases, and the students absolutely love them. They feel like they're learning something they'll really use after graduation in their careers. This is just an email I received uh, from, a, from a student. Professor Drake, I thought I'd let you know that I used the SEC Gov website to access some financial statements I needed for a real world project I'm working on. I felt incredibly empowered when I was able to use the skill you've spent the entire semester teaching. Thank you for giving me an actual skill that I've already found value in. Sincerely appreciate it. You know, as instructors, we don't get a lot of these emails. Well, maybe you do, but you know, I, I when I do get them, though, I just cherish these things. You know, they get printed out. You put them on the wall next to the picture of your family because these these are the things that just uh, make it worth it and warm your heart. And I'll tell you, teaching students tools and skills that they'll use that will help them be successful in their future careers. That's that's what they want. And I think that's part of what is our responsibility to deliver, okay? With that, I will turn the time over to Wayne Thomas to talk more about some features of the book. All right, thanks, Mike. So hopefully everyone's getting an idea of what Jake and Mike have set up as this very flexible approach, a real world experience. Because I think all of us listening, you know, we, we want our class to be dynamic. We want students to be engaged, but we also know that bringing the real world in, it takes a lot of work on the part of the instructor. And so one of the main focus of what we wanted to do was to make that easy for you, because that's what we do in our class. Uh, I know Jake talked about that I teach an asynchronous MBA course. I just finished my eight week uh, asynchronous MBA course. And I assigned a couple of at least two, sometimes up to four real world cases every class period or every, you know, asynchronous section. And of my 120 MBA students that I ran through, I didn't get one question about now, where do I go? What do I do? Uh, how do I find this report? It's just easily contained uh, easy for students to see. Uh, what I did get was a bunch of people commenting about other things they were discovering as they went to the SEC website or something really neat they found in the report that they just wanted to follow up and ask me about. For example, we have this one real world case that is Lowe's versus Home Depot. And it just so happens I signed the case and I had one of the uh, one of the individuals in my NBA class worked for Lowe's. He was on the management team. And so he wrote to me and said he was so excited to show his bosses that he in his MBA course, he was asked to do a, a Lowe's analysis versus Home Depot. He lived in Philadelphia, but his his bosses were down in Atlanta. So, you know, we were going through that. And he he wanted to jump on a Zoom session with me and talk about it. So we did. And you know, these are the types of spontaneous activity you get from students when you bring in the real world. So what we did is we wanted to make that easy. And I, and I hope that Mike and Jake really laid out for you what that entails. And so just to give you a little bit more background, I'm actually in McGraw Hills Connect. And if I want to go to assignment material, I just click add assignment question bank. And we're all used to saying, OK, here's chapter six on inventory. 
what brief exercises and exercises do I want? But a real world problem is the same one click away. I would click on this and there I go. I can pick all these real world companies. I can look at Sprouts, GameStop, Broadcom, Caterpillar, American Eagle, Buckle. I can do ethics. I've got sustainability. You know, that's what our students are really interested in now. So this sustainability report is about the gap. And did you know gap has a code of vendor conduct? And what does this code do? Well, it looks at how its raw materials are sourced, labor conditions in the supply chain, and the impact of inventory sourcing on the environment. We ask students to go out to the report, we give them the link, and then gather some of the information in these sustainability reports. This makes students feel like they're doing stuff that matters when they're looking at real companies, real reports. So that's just a lot. There's a lot to show you that uh, I need to be really efficient with our time. I'm, I'm looking that we just have about 15 minutes left. Um, I did want to also show you in the question bank before I leave that. So I'll go back to chapter six. Any of these would apply, but what Jake tended to show you, and I use this a lot in my asynchronous class, uh, or even in, when I'm teaching, you know, even financial accounting to undergraduates. So for example, if I wanted to, let's just say I want to pick out some multiple choice questions, I can filter just to get all the multiple choice. And then if I come down here, Maybe I want to create a bunch of questions that don't involve debits credits. So I say, no, I don't want debits credits and I can filter. And now I can see all the multiple choice that don't require debits and credits. Or maybe I'm in a class that does require debits credits. So I want that. Now I've got all the multiple choice. Every one of these requires that you know debits credits. So depending on what you want to do with your class, it is simply a one click filter away. All right. And let's see what else to show you here. And, and I can't go. Unfortunately, I can't go through the videos because we just don't have time. But let me tell you, in setting up my asynchronous class, how convenient it was to have hundreds of videos already at my disposal that at my disposal that could be assigned and they come with questions that are auto graded. So I go to these concept overviews. And you can see just for these chapter, just for chapter six, all of these different videos that are available. So whether you're doing an in-person, online, or asynchronous course, uh, you can be online synchronous or online asynchronous, all of these videos can be assigned and come with auto-graded questions. So you're getting a feel that we're trying to give you, no matter what type of course you have, we have those resources locked, loaded, and auto-graded for your convenience. So I hope that's coming across loud and clear. Now, one bank that I need to get to before our time ends is this data analytics bank, as well as our Excel bank. So within our data analytics, let me switch back to my uh, PowerPoint here. We are moving, we have, just a complete suite of data analytics assignments. For example, we have data visualizations. So think of an accounting concept, now turn it into a picture, and then ask questions about that picture in a purposeful order to get that student to the higher level of understanding. How about live dashboards? Many of the graduate students that are coming back to school are working with companies that work with dashboards. Dashboards are essentially used in every organization now, it seems like. So let's give them accounting dashboards to answer accounting questions, build to those higher level concepts. If you want, there are even uh, assignments that let your students work in the software tableau. Now when, number two, let me back up one step to dashboards. When they're working in dashboards, they don't need to know tableau at all. They just simply interact with the dashboard. That's what I'm about to show you. And then we have different Excel assignments. So just as a quick example of what we're talking about for visualizations, think about the concept of retain earnings. How would you explain that to your student? Well, there's my text and it's, it's correct, but we know students struggle with that concept. So let's give them a column of numbers. Maybe that helps a few more students because we can calculate it, but why not offer them a picture of what retain earnings is? And then to build that concept, where do I look first 
on this picture and where do I look next? Well, let's ask them questions in that same order. So I want you first to focus on year one retain earnings. Understand that number. Now I want you to build to that higher concept. I want you to take that chunk and move it forward and add it to year two. And then I want you to take those chunks forward and add it to year three. And you see, that's the concept. So how can I ask questions in that order? Well, that's what we're going to do with these assignments. And you can see it walks them through the years. Or how about the concepts of depreciation? Just give them a small vignette setting of this CFO needing uh, to purchase a delivery truck and looking at different depreciation methods. So what do I want you to understand? Well, there's different depreciation methods, which will calculate a different amount each year. But that higher level concept, ultimately, these accumulate to the same amount. So let's first ask them some questions about understanding the different depreciation methods and then about the accumulation of those amounts. So let me switch back over to here and go back out and kind of show you what this looks like on the student assessment side. So when you create a data visualization, and again, it's, it's one click away from assigning the same as you would any brief exercises and everything I'm about to show you is auto graded. Uh, I'm gonna look at this in student assignment view, but this is what your students will see when they come in to do a data visualization. There's the retain earnings one we just talked about, and they'll fill in those blanks. Everything is either insert a number or select from the drop down menu. Uh, there's the depreciation one. Here's an installment note, uh, cash flows versus accrual trending over time. So just different ideas behind how to take an accounting concept and turn it into a picture. Okay, now with just the few minutes we have left, I want to go to what something that I use very frequently in class. I use it on exams. I use it during the lecture. It really gets students engaged, and that are these dashboard activities. So now, instead of just looking at a picture, let me get that up. So instead of this just being a picture, it's a live dashboard. So here you see my mouse out to the side. And as I move the mouse in, I'm beginning to gather information from that particular data point, okay? Now this is meant to be a very introductory one to get student buy-in to the importance of this course they're about to take. But here we see six real world companies. We see their stock price chart and then various accounting data. The questions below ask, let me blow that up a little bit for you, which company has the greater increase in stock price and which company shows more profitability? The idea is we want to get students to buy into the accounting they're about to learn really relates to something of value, stock price. So a student would go up here and they say, well, it looks like stock price went up the most for Nike. Now, which company has the better trend in profitability over these same years? Well, and it's clear that Mike, Nike's net income is far above the declining profitability of Under Armour. And so students would pick that. And then they get to a second level of questions and it says, well, now let's look at Domino's and Papa John's pizza. So a student has to go up here and to get the right answer, I've got to start interacting with the data, with the picture. So I'm going to take off Nike. I'm going to take off Under Armour. Now I'm going to add Domino's and Papa John's. And I'm going to answer the questions about its stock price. And this one is actually related to the revenues of the company. And you can see Domino's has a better trend in revenues and up goes the, the stock price more. And then the last one is, is going to deal with Microsoft and IBM. So a student, once again, the only way to get the right answers on these dashboards are for you or for, for your students to interact with these. And so you're getting the idea that we've gone from words to numbers to visuals to interaction with those visuals as we're building these higher level concepts and students. This one is three real world companies. We've got Ruth's and it tells the student, in case you don't know what Ruth's is, it's a fine dining restaurant. In case you don't know what Sprouts Farmer's Market is, it's a health grocery store chain. And how about Wendy's? What do you guys think Wendy's is? Would you say a fast food restaurant? 
Well, Wendy's has a nice play. And these are these words are directly from the, the annual report of Wendy's. It's a distinctive quick service restaurant. Isn't that fancier than fast food? All right. Well, this one is about the COVID pandemic. And I'm going to ask you ahead of time, which of these companies do you think revenue increased during COVID? And which of these companies do you think revenues decreased during COVID? And students are asked, to respond to that in these questions. And as you might imagine, a fine dining restaurant like Ruth's, nobody was going to during the pandemic. So you see a significant drop in its 2020 revenues. If you click on Sprouts, a health food grocery store chain, its revenues popped during COVID. And so that's the idea about bringing the real world both in skills development, but also in content and interest to our students in the classroom. Students are gonna complete these dashboards, auto-graded. You as an instructor have not increased your effort in teaching. Matter of fact, what you're gonna be doing is fielding a lot more interesting questions in class, in discussion with students on these materials. Now, I think we've got just a little bit of time for some questions. I'm going to flash up some more dashboards, but I won't take the time because I want to stop to see if we have any questions. But just to see how the variety of different concepts you can teach. And by the way, you're not adding content. You're not having to say, well, my class is already crowded. How do I fit this in? This can replace some of your standard exercises. We often have students calculate uncollectible accounts, make an adjusting entry, figure out the balance sheet and income statement effects. Well, now we're just going to replace a typical exercise with a dashboard that shows them, well, here's your total receivables, here's the age group, and here's the uncollectability of that age group. And by the way, if you want to look at the subsidiary ledger, which we typically can't do in homework problems, now we can. And then here's the extra question on this that's a new type of question. What do you think a manager cares about? What customer that's over 60 days past due owes me the most? As a student, the only way I get that answer is to interact with the dashboard. I'll go to the filter to the, my 60 days. Here's my subsidiary ledger. It looks like customer 137 owes me the most. And these I really will do. And this is a uh, subsidiary ledgers for property, plant, and equipment. Um, I've got installment notes. And look, you can look at the payment schedule, the trend of what the portion goes to principal. I can select a 60 month note, 20 month note. I can change the interest rate each time. And all the questions are walking students through these different scenarios where they're changing the dashboard in real time to glean the the information they need to get the question right. Now, I'm gonna pause for a minute. I've got two more hours of materials to show you that we can't get to, uh, but I do wanna take a few minutes to answer any questions. And I have more to show if there are no questions, but certainly happy to. Mike and Jake will help as well. Noel or Harper, were there any questions in the chat? I haven't been able to keep up. No, Wayne, I did not see any questions. Okay. Um, so, so go go right ahead. Okay. So just just to, in the little bit of time we have, I think you've got the idea of these dashboards. What's the extra question that's fun to ask on this as opposed to just doing the accounting? Well, this one says, now, what do you guys think your students would say? Let me ask you. You're a 120 month installment note, right? 120 months. How much do you owe <clears throat> on your note 60 days in, 60 months in after 60 payments? on your 120 month note, how much do you owe? Do you think your students might say, well, we owe half of it? And this scenario is the company went and needs a borrowing and it's, de it's determining alternatives, ways to borrow. Well, students can scroll down to the 60th month and see that of their 100,000 loan, they still owe 64,000. So they're nowhere close to halfway because principal portion is an increasing amount lower in the first years. Okay, so I think we have just about three minutes left. Are you guys getting a sense of the real world, the auto grading, the flexibility? 
One other thing I could show you in just a couple of minutes we have left, if you do want your students to work in Excel, we also have that as an auto graded assignment. So this one is gonna start out and this one's gonna be on depreciation. And so it says, okay, you're about to go into an Excel assignment student. And here's some basic things you'll wanna know about Excel, like how to do a cell reference or basic math functions. Maybe you're gonna need the sum function on this exercise. And you're gonna learn the SLN function, straight line, or the DDB, double declining balance. Once a student can read what they're about to learn, they go into Excel. And so what you're looking at now is Excel, but it's contained. It's actual Excel, but contained within Connect. So everything you're about to do with your students, they're going to submit for auto grading. So a student would come down and I'll just do one small part with our remaining time. But this one is we're going to calculate straight line depreciation. So I'm going to go down here for depreciation expense in the first year. And I'm gonna say equals SLN parentheses. And it says, I need to enter the cost, salvage and life. So I'll enter the cost, salvage and life. And I'll calculate year one depreciation. And let me just go ahead and do year two really fast. All right, and now I'm ready, oops. Oops, okay. Do that again. Because I want to I want to mess up on one part to show you what students see. Okay. Now what's accumulated depreciation? Instead of typing in the number, I'm going to reference the cell. But let's say there, let me stop there and now let me mess up. As a student, I say, oh, I see. So I just accumulate revenue, right? So what is year two amount going to be? And as a student, I say, well, it's 35 plus 35. And I'm typing in a number. And so I'm going to check my work. And notice when I check my work, it's going to say, well, you've got three cells right, but you missed the fourth one. And it gives me this warning. You must enter an Excel formula. I say, oh, I forgot my Excel formula. And when I do this one, I can either say if I want, I could do this plus this, that would give me the right answer. Or if I want, I can also do the sum of this. We know that both of those are going to result in the same amount. And both will give students credit for doing Excel correctly. I submit my assignment for auto grading. So I'm going to pause there one more time um, to kind of see if there are any questions. We didn't get to demonstrating the hundreds of videos we have or even more.